I've always felt that very successful people in finance and in politics, and you've been in both, are probably higher up on the psychopath spectrum. Do you think you're some way up there? Yes. I mean, you know, psychopath, and you know, I, I, I have a conscience. I don't think I'm, I could ever really be in politics. This is probably why I only lasted 11 days. I have a conscience and I understand, I think, from my upbringing, the difference between right and wrong, and I want to do the right thing, and I don't want to be that hypocrite that principle is hypocrite that you sort of need to be in politics. But, but so I, I don't think I'm a psychopath that way, but I do think I'm a psychopath in the sense that I don't really fear too many things. You know, my, my attitude is we're here visiting the planet. Uh, I've also been very blessed with a very good life. Uh, Mel Brooks, the American comedian has a great line says, relax, none of us are getting out of here alive. And I think it's a beautiful line about how you got to live your life. And so My attitude is, uh, I left Goldman. People said, you got a great job. Your father was a crane operator. Why would you leave Goldman? I said, well, I want to have my own business. Well, suppose your business fails. Didn't care. Uh, And then I sold that business successfully. I left Lehman. I mean, if you had told me Lehman was going to out of business and Skybridge was going to make it, I would probably not believe that, but that happened. Um, And my attitude is, I'm going to do what I think is right for me. And I'm also not going to care much about what other people think. You know, like right now, I'm getting my ass kicked in my fund. My fund is down. Uh, Bloomberg reported that it was down 39% for the year 2022, which it was. We're now up 10 this year. So we're sort of in 13 months, we're down about 34. I mean, it is what it is. But I mean, they're writing one bad article about me a day. You would think I'm like the most important money manager in the world. Like I'm running like I'm running two billion dollars, but they're writing about me like I'm running two trillion, which is a bunch of nonsense. You either give me shit or you don't. I personally don't. My attitude is I'm bringing my clients into the future uh, with these investments and these growth areas and this digital technology. And the ones that are smart will stay patient. They're going to be very handsomely rewarded by the process. But unfortunately, everybody is a long-term investor until they have short-term losses and they panic and they run around like nuts. Um, but I don't have that fear. you know. So me, I guess that's uh, psychopathic or sociopathic. I don't know what it is, but my attitude is if you're going to make a difference, if you're going to push yourself, you can't be conventional. And a result of which uh, not being conventional is taking more risk than the average person. There's a difference between what they call cognitive empathy and effective empathy. And cognitive empathy would be what you described, I think, is that you're able to understand right and wrong and and why some things are good or bad and that kind of thing. But then effective empathy is actually feeling the the sort of sadness of others. And when something bad happens to someone, you feel it. Do you, Would you say you have that as well? Well, I would like to think I have that. I mean, you know, you'd have to ask my wife really if I had that. I think she would say I have that. I mean, you know, the pro- the problem is when you're out there like me and you get monikered as a narcissist. And so then the first thing people say, well, if you're a narcissist, you have no empathy for others. I don't frankly see myself as a narcissist because, and again, this is just my opinion of being a narcissist. You know, nar- narcissists are focused on themselves. If you look at my career, the people that have worked with me or my family, you know, I've really tried to focus on taking care of them, taking care of the people that work with me alongside of me at Skybridge. And so I don't see that. Um, but if, if you said to me that I am a, uh, Someone that has narcissistic features, I would say, yes, I definitely have some narcissistic features. And I think that comes from my upbringing, because if you grow up like I did in a violent household and you grow up in a household that has like a fractured uh, way of going about things and you don't have a lot of parental guidance or role modeling, you self-soothe or self-parent yourself. And so... You have to set up belief systems about yourself so that you can get through the day. So I do think that that creates some narcissistic features. I don't think I could talk about it as openly. You know, you find that real narcissists are like, they scoff at it and they pretend that they're, they're nothing like that. You follow, you follow what I'm saying? So, you know, and I mean, you'd have to ask my wife. I think ultimately, I think I have a lot of empathy for people. It's not just because of the charitable work I do. It's because of the way I 
care about the people around me. Also, my grandmother was a maid. And so you better believe that you got to treat people below you in my company better than you're treating the people above you. Otherwise, you probably get fired by somebody like me. I don't like, I don't like when subordinates are mistreated. And I'm always leaving money in hotel rooms because that person could be somebody's grandmother. So I don't know if that's cognitive empathy or the other type of empathy that you said, but I do think that I, I'm mindful that the woman or the man that's cleaning my room probably needs the money, you know, and I, and I always try to make sure I'm over tipping people because I've been blessed and, uh, probably the people that are serving me could use the help. You were going to ask me a question. You wanted me to talk about something. I'm sorry. I was on a little. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about that um, violent household. No, my father was a rough guy. You know, you, you grew up in a blue collar neighborhood out on Long Island where your dad is in the union and he's a heavy smoker and he drinks and he's working a crane and he's got a tremendous amount of economic anxiety because he has no control over his earnings. Um, you can have a lot of hostility and acting out in a household. And so, you know, it was a tough upbringing. You know, my older brother uh, has cycled in and out of drug addiction. I sort of channeled it into workaholism. Um, it, it's a uh, manifestation of a reality um, that you just have to accept. You know, now listen, my father's 87. I take care of him. I have forgiven him for whatever the hell happened. I mean, you have to do that too. You forgive people for yourself more than anything else. But, but yeah, it was a rough upbringing and it manifested itself into different things. You know, you, when you grow up in a dysfunctional family, people take on roles. You know, one of my roles, frankly, was, okay, I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to go to some good schools. I'm going to try to do the right thing. But let me tell you, it never works out that way because you grow up in a violent household, you either become violent or you go to the antipode of that. You go to the other side of that and you become a conflict avoider. And I think me being a conflict avoider for the first 15 or 20 years of my business career hurt me. Um, you know, I've been, I've been more cognizant of that and I'm more available for conflict now. You know, if someone's starting shit with me, I have no problem going back at them. I don't like starting it, but I know how to finish it. You know, when Trump went after me, I was like, okay, no problem. Go right back at him. I don't care. You know, I, I know how to deal with bullies. Trust me. I grew up in a neighborhood with bullies. And so, you know, you got to be ready to fight a bully. Join me on The Edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.